Recording in progress. Okay, I guess we can start in uh, two or three minutes. Uh, the dhant is everything okay on your end? Can you start streaming now? Okay, see. Recording stopped. Uh, we're going to okay. just wait for two more minutes, right, Pratyush? And then you can. Uh, Start by giving an intro of MAMP to everyone, and uh, then you can meet MAMP people. All right. Okay. Oh. All right. So, Abdul, can we start now? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay, all right. So, hello, everyone, to another talk by Seth Celestia. Today, we have Professor Sarbani Panu with us, and she is a professor at Department of Astronomy in Yale University. She specializes in the study of sun and other stars using data on st stellar oscillations. And today she will be talking about the study of the interior of the sun using solar oscillations. So let me try sharing my screen again. I hope this is visible. Yes, ma'am. Good, lovely. Uh, do feel free to interrupt me if something isn't clear. So what I'd like to talk to you about is how do we figure out what is going on inside the sun? And the first question, which many people ask me, that you're an astronomer, why do you study the sun? And of course, the sun is a star. It's the prototypical star. It's our closest star. So it makes sense to understand the sun in that sense. However, we have more vested interest in studying the sun. I mean, the sun affects everything on Earth. So I know it's a truism. We are, we are told that, yes, without the sun, there wouldn't be life on Earth. Without solar energy, we would not be here. Because every form of energy that we use, whether it's, you know, renewable energy or not, it's still triggered by sunlight, by the energy from the sun. But the sun doesn't always have a positive effect. It can have negative effects, not so much in life, but on society. And that is caused by the magnetic cycle of the sun, because periodically the sun can emit flares and masses, something called coronal mass ejections, where it actually emits particles. And they interact with the Earth's magnetic field to cause uh, geomagnetic storms. And geomagnetic storms can affect technology. So that's yet another reason to figure out what the sun does. Okay. So a bit of history. When we talk about the malevolent effects of the sun on technology, mind, 
Uh, the first indication was a humongous flare and coronal mass ejection in 1859. Uh, this is known as the Carrington event after Carrington who first observed it. And what was noticed is that telegraph wires had caught fire. And telegraphs were about the uh, most sophisticated technology that anybody had in 1859. And uh, it the effects on that on the telegraph wire, basically, because you have wires, you have the, a geomagnetic form means you have a moving magnetic field. Moving a conductor in a moving magnetic field means you have electricity generated. So you had the wires were overloaded. Okay. Now today, there are a lot more te technological. Um, things that could be affected by solar storms. So for example, you have satellites, you know, you have uh, aviation because most long haul airplanes fly very high in the atmosphere. The passengers and crew are in danger of increased radiation when you have a solar event. Uh, solar events can uh, basically give you erroneous GPS signals. So even though your GPS might tell you you are at some place, you could actually be in a different place. And you could over, overload electric wires. In fact, electric wires overloading in 1989, the entire northern half, northeastern half of Canada had become dark because the electrical grid was overloaded. Okay. And then there was a near nuclear war in May 1967. This was before people had started really understanding the effects of solar flares and mass ejections on technology. And what was found is that radars in Greenland suddenly start, stopped giving signals. And the first reaction of the United States Air Force was that, oh, this must be the Soviet Union jamming the signal. So they actually scrambled uh, warplanes and everything. But fortunately, by then, the Air Force had actually started a department to study the sun, and they were convinced that, okay, it wasn't the Soviet Union, so things were fine. But it was a fairly close call. Okay. So what is the basic problem here? Uh, it's basically that we can't predict these solar events. And for that matter, we can't even predict the solar cycle. So what's the solar cycle? You see a periodic rise and fall of the number of sunspots. The period is roughly 11 years, but it's only very roughly. But the sunspots are intimately linked to flares and CMEs because those are generally what cause flares and CMEs. So if you have more sunspots, you have more of these events. So we are hopeless at the moment of predicting them. Now, if you want to know how hopeless, so this is roughly on the y-axis here, the predicted number of sunspots that people had expected to see at the maximum of solar cycle 23. We are currently just entering solar cycle 25. So it's so on the maximum of solar cycle, uh, sorry, this is 24. The maximum of solar cycle 24 was sometime uh, in 2015-ish in that period. And these are all the predictions by different people. And you can see they scan from very large number of sunspots to very small number of sunspots at the maximum. This line here that I've drawn, the blue one, that was the actual number of sunspots at the maximum. So you can see that most of these models were completely wrong. Now we do have predictions for cycle 25. Uh, this was for cycle 24. This is the average of all the previous maxima. So the question of which of these models is going to predict cycle 25 correctly. We won't know that for another three or four years, but that's the problem. We are affected by the solar cycle, but, we cannot predict it, so we cannot predict its events. 
which means we cannot take mitigation strategies. Okay. So what can we do? So the idea is, you know, the solar cycle occurs. It has to be for something inside the sun, something happening inside the sun. So what we want to do is detect and hopefully understand, the understanding part hasn't quite happened yet, what is happening inside the sun, okay? Now, what can we do? We look at helioseismology because helioseismology allows us to A, figure out what the solar interior look like, and B, we have enough data, uh, data to figure out uh, is there a change with solar cycle? So there's a question saying, what do I mean the strength of a solar cycle? It means at the maximum of the solar cycle, what, uh, sorry, why can't I go back? What is the number of sunspots that you will see? So because at the minimum, there are no sunspots, the number of sunspots increase to a maximum and then they decrease. So what is the maximum that we see at any given time on the sun? That is the strength of the solar cycle. So coming back to helioseismology, now, helioseismology is similar to, but it uses different techniques than what geoseismologists use. So geoseismologists use earthquakes and use those to study what's happening inside the Earth. So what happens is you have, you can see my cursor, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. So you have an earthquake somewhere and the waves travel through the earth and there's a time difference when you when the earthquake happens say here and you detect the waves here or there okay so this is sort of a, 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 a just an image of that okay so each of these stations, the farther away you are from the epicenter, the later you will see the signal, and that allows you to try and figure out what happens inside the Earth. Helioseismology, we use normal modes or eigenmodes of the sun. So we're used to eigenmodes, or you should be. So for example, these are eigenmodes of a one-dimensional string. So if any of you play a stringed instrument, you know that the fundamental mode means there are no nodes inside the string except at the two points the string is attached. First harmonic, there's a node in the middle. Second harmonic, there are two nodes in the middle and so on. So since it's a one dimensional object, one number is sufficient to characterize this oscillation. Two dimensional, think of a drum, a tabla. So, here, you need two numbers because you could have nodes along the circumference. So in this case, you see there's a node where the membrane is attached and there's a node in the middle. And you could also have nodes in the radial direction. So in these three upper cases, there are no nodes in the radial direction. While in the lower cases, you can see nodes in the radial direction. So you need two numbers. So incidentally, just as a string, you can represent the oscillations in terms of sines and cosines. For a two-dimensional surface, you do it in terms of Bessel functions. Now, a star is a three-dimensional object, so you need two functions, one in latitude, one in longitude to describe the oscillations at the surface and you need two numbers rather, and you need another number to describe how many nodes you have in the interior. Three dimensional need three numbers. So in the case of stars, we describe the oscillations on the surface by spherical harmonics. Those of you who've done quantum mechanics and have, do, have had to uh, derive the, uh, the wave function of a hydrogen atom, you would have come across spherical harmonics there. It's exactly the same. The, the function along the interior, however, is different. Now, sorry, let me go back. Yeah, so this is what 
the oscillations of the sun would look like. This is, you can see the date on the top. The average period of the oscillation, and I shouldn't say average, the predominant period of the oscillation is about five minutes. So the period is roughly five minutes. So how do we observe them? Okay, basically Doppler shift. You take an image of the sun, but not a normal photograph. You take a Doppler image. So each pixel gives you a velocity. So part of the sun is coming towards you, part of it is going away from you. So you get a velocity. So that'll tell you the oscillation. So what do the observations actually look like? Sorry. So this is what a single Doppler image looks like. You see this big signal, which is two kilometers per second, red going away, white coming towards you. This is solar rotation. The sun rotates at roughly two kilometers per second. So the first thing you need to do is get rid of that signal, but that's easy. You can do that. Then what is remaining is this sort of stuff here. Most of this is not oscillation. Most of this is fluid flows because the outer part of the sun, uh, heat is transported by convection, which means material motion. And this is basically the tops of the material motion. You have to get rid of that. And that's taken by subtracting a running mean from the images. And then what is left behind? what you see are the oscillations. And this is just one snapshot. Once you have enough snapshots, you can make a movie out of it. Then what you do is you find the frequencies by doing a Fourier transform. But before you can do a Fourier transform, remember this is a three-dimensional object. You could have many different kinds of modes. So you have to do a spherical harmonic transform first then do a Fourier transform to get to all the frequencies. So let me give you a sort of formal crash course on helio seismology first. So the sun oscillates in millions of modes. And these oscillations are linear and adiabatic. By linear, I mean small amplitude. Uh, the, what you need to compare at the surface of the sun is the amplitude of the oscillation, velocity amplitude of the oscillations, which are a few meters, tens of meters per second, versus the speed of sound, which is 10 kilometers per second. So it's a nice linear regime. And for most part, the waves are adiabatic. They're sound waves, okay? All observed modes are P modes, which are sound waves. And we also see a surface mode. These are like waves at the surface of water. We see both these types. And as I've mentioned before, each mode is characterized by three numbers. N, which is called the radial order, which is the number of nodes inside the sun. L, the degree, is the number of cir nodal circles on the circumference. So L of zero means the entire star going in and out. L of one will have one nodal circle. L of two will have two. And N is the azimuthal order, which is the number of nodes along the equator. And M goes from plus L to minus L. It's a property of spherical harmonics that it does that. Okay. Now, the thing is, when I say number of nodes along the equator, you need to be able to define an equator to do so. Now, if you had a completely spherically symmetric object, then there is no equator. So all the modes with the same L and N, but different M would have the same frequency. But the sun rotates, so it's not spherically symmetric. It's still spherical in shape, but it's no longer spherically symmetric because rotation breaks symmetry. Once you have a rotation, you can define an equator, you can define a northern half, you can define a southern half. So what rotation does is lifts this degeneracy and gives rise to what we call rotational splittings, meaning the plus M frequencies and the minus M frequencies are different. And these splittings depend on the rotation rate here. Now, mostly we don't find the frequencies of every M component because that would be too much. You describe the frequency of 
any mode as a central frequency that depends only on N and L and an expansion in polynomials. This is interesting because and useful because the central frequency only depends on the structure and the odd order polynomials depend only on rotation. So you can find the structure as well as rotation independently, which is what you do. Now, the reason this works to build up a picture of the solar interior is that different modes penetrate to different depths inside the sun, and that lets us build, us, build up a picture of the sun, okay? So what do we do? See, normally in astrophysics, you make an observation. How do you interpret the observation? You make a model of the object and try to see what are the observables that the models predict. If the model predictions are the same as the observations, the model is considered to be a good one and a proxy for the object. But because we have so much solar data, we don't have to do that. Since the frequencies depend on the structure, we can actually what we call invert frequencies to find out the solar structure independently of models. This lets, lets us test solar models in detail. And this figure just shows that these are the inverted and exact sound speed, relative sound speed difference and relative density difference between two solar models using modes that would be observed, that can be observed. And you can see that the inverted and exact match quite well. So this lets, lets us figure out whether the models of solar interior are any good, okay? And we know that we really can model the solar interior very well. These are relative sound speed difference, actually squared sound speed difference, so twice the relative difference in sound speed between two fairly good solar models and the sun. Look at the scale. These are differences of fractions of a percent, which means we can really get the, we really can model the structure. Yes, there are issues, say here, we actually know what causes those. Models don't do turbulent mixing uh, at the base of the convection zone. Uh, so that's why you get this here. But yeah, we don't quite understand this dip here, but you can see it's tiny. So overall, we can actually model the internal structure very well. So, which is a good, which is a relief. It also means that our theory of stellar structure and evolution is reasonably correct. So density differences are slightly higher, but that too, just 2%. Yes, we're not getting it perfect because you can see it's still a many sigma difference from zero. If we had a perfect model, the difference would be zero in both cases, but we're still doing very well. The problem comes in rotation. So the sun rotates and that has been known since the first observations of sunspots because it's the sunspots that show the sun rotates. And what has also been known that the equator rotates faster than the higher latitudes, which is why the rotation has this shape. It's also known that different types of sunspots give you slightly different rotation rates. So medium sunspots seem to give a slightly different rotation rate than smaller sunspots which probably presumably means that they're anchored at different points inside the sun, okay? Now, looking at the fact that the rotation rate depends on the latitude, the theories had suggested that solar rotation could be modeled by, you know, each layer of the sun being rotating on cylinders, the fastest cylinder being the one that is at the equator, then it becomes slower, like the blue one is slower than the red one and the green one is slower than the blue one. In other words, if I plot surfaces of constant rotation 
inside the sun, the contours, or ice rotation contours, as we call them, would be parallel to the rotation axis. So this is what a simulation, a simple simulation gave. Turns out, helioseismology tells us that solar interior, interior rotation does not look anything like this at all. This is what it looks like instead. You can see the contours. These are given by the colors. They are not parallel. Oops, sorry. They're not parallel to the, rota uh, the rotation axis. They are almost radial in the outer convection zone of the sun. So you see this black dash, dashed line here. That marks the region of the sun where the interior energy is transported by radiation and in the shallower regions, energy is transported by convection. So in the convection zone, you can see that the rotation rate increases slightly from the surface inwards. It's almost constant along a radius in the convection zone and then sort of becomes, you know, constant below that. It's clearer if we look at sections at different latitudes. So these are cuts of the rotation rate at different latitudes. Oh, Ma'am, can you hear us? There seems to be an issue with ma'am's internet connection. Please wait for a second. Yeah. 
Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Our entire university seemed to have gone off suddenly for five minutes. <laughs> so, okay, so can I just start where I left? Yes, ma'am. Okay, sorry about this, but you never know. <laughs> uh, okay, so as I was saying, this is what the helioseismic inversion show us about the... Uh, excuse me, can, can you start sharing your screen? It's Oh, sorry, I had, I should have done that. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So this is the uh, solar internal rotation, which helioseismology tells us. And you can see that this does not look like this picture at all. And we don't really understand it yet. And it's, the simulations have not quite been able to reproduce all the features that we see in the simulation, so uh, uh, that we see in the sun. So particularly, A, that the contours are not parallel to the rotation axis. There's a slight increase in the rotation rate as you go from the surface to the interior. And then that in the radiative zone, the rotation rate becomes a constant. If I take uh, sections, then you can see, so the black is the equator, blue is 30 degrees, uh, red is 60 degrees. You can see that the change here, which is known as the tachocline, is latitude dependent. So at the equator, the outer layers rotate faster than the inside at, the, at 60 degrees and higher latitudes, the outer layers rotate smaller than what's inside. This is where most people believe that the solar dynamo, which produces um, the, um, uh, causes the solar cycle, most people believe that's there. The question is, do the convection zone near, zones near the top and bottom cause large shifts in the magnetic field? Okay, so the convection zone is only in the outer layers. And simple theory, which may not com be completely correct, says that convection zones are buoyant when a, uh, sorry, magnetic fields are buoyant in a convection zone. So they'll be moved up if, so that's why people say that you have to generate the magnetic field somewhere below the convection zone and then the magnetic field moves up, and that's why we see the sunspots on the surface once the field is generated. But people are beginning to question that because you see this sudden layer of change. This is another shear layer, and it is quite possible that you would be able to have a local dynamo there. So there are people who are looking into it. Now, let's look at the mean surface shear layer. The logarithmic gradient of the rotation rate there is almost a constant. So Gong, HMI, and MDI are three uh, projects. So Gong is a ground-based project. MDI was an instrument on the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory on Soho, which is called Soho. It's no longer operational, but it covered all of Solar Cycle 23, so from 1996 to the end of 2010. And HMI is the successor of MDI. It had a one year overlap with MDI. So it started observing in 2009. It is still observing. Okay. The colors are depths inside the sun. And you can see that the gradient is highest closest to the surface and then becomes smaller and smaller. You expect that because, see, the gradient, there is very little gradient in the uh, deeper inside the convection zone. Here, even though it looks like a straight line, it turns out if you really do the actual calculations, it's not a straight line. These wiggles are because of data limitations have gone. So uh, don't worry too much about that. Now, the other thing that happens in the sun is you have the rotation rate, which depends on uh, latitude. 
if you remove the average rotation rate, what you find are eastward and westward flows like jet streams or you know the colored bands of Jupiter. Now, these are not very easy to detect because look at the amplitude. They're 15 meters per second. And remember at the surface, solar rotation is two kilometers per second. So these are difficult measurements to make, but fortunately seismic data are really, really good. So we can do that. The other type of measurement, which is done by a different type of seismology, not by normal modes, because normal modes are, are sensitive only to north-south symmetric uh, features on the sun, are what we call meridional flows that go from the equator to the poles. Again, the signature at is of the order of 10 to 30 meters per second. It's latitude dependent. So again, small signatures. But, and the other thing is, near the poles, there are these long lived swirls of prograde and retrograde features, even smaller in magnitude. Now, when we did this work, the, quite a few years ago. We didn't know what they were. We only looked at three months of data. Uh, but now there's been a paper this year from the Max Planck group in Göttingen, Germany, which seems to suggest that these are torsional modes of the sun. So a different kind of mode altogether, which we'll see if this interpretation holds or not. Okay, now what about the changes? I'll tell you from the very beginning that there are very few changes in solar structure with solar cycle. So I'm not going to talk about it. Solar structure changes are A, difficult to determine. B, you don't expect a change unless the magnetic fields are very, very strong because to change structure, you need magnetic fields where the magnetic pressure is much, much larger. Well, not much, much larger, but is of the order of the gas pressure. For the interior of the sun, the gas pressure is extremely high, which means you need hundreds of megagauss magnetic fields to get that sort of pressure. So I'm not going to talk about structure, but the interesting changes are in dynamics, okay? So let's take a look at that. What do I see here? What do I show here? Remember the figure of solar rotation? What I've done is at each time that I have a data set, you do an inversion for the solar rotation, meaning at each time I get an image like this, I average the, these results over cycle 23 and then separately over cycle 24 and subtract the average from the rotation rate at any given time. Okay, So these are deviations from the average. Now, the top figure shows the residuals, which are the deviations from the average fairly close to the surface from these are the space-based data. These are the ground-based data. This white column here demarcates cycle 23 from cycle 24. This thin black line is the maximum of the two solar cycles. So when you have the most sunspots, this blue line is we had lost contact with Soho for a while. So no data there. And on this figure, we've also marked where the sunspots appeared. So what can you see here? You can see prograde flows that go from the higher latitudes, mid latitudes, towards the equator as the solar cycle progresses. And you see, also see prograde flows that go from the same active latitudes towards the poles as the solar cycle progresses, and that sunspots coincide with the equator word prograde flow. What is the cause? What is the effect? We do not know. There must be feedback. 
But you can see that these flows and the positions of sunspots are intimately related. Mystery, people trying to figure out is why. We do not know that. So these flows, because we're talking about east-west flows here, are known as zonal flows. Okay. So yeah, that was mystery number one. The second mystery, as you can see during, so cycle 24 was weaker than cycle 23. And you can also see that the flows during cycle 24 were weaker than those during cycle 23. What's, so whatever makes the cycle weaker also makes the flows weaker. But again, it's a chicken and an egg problem. Is it the weaker flows that make the cycle weak or is it the weaker cycle that makes the flows weak? Can't really say. Now, remember the new surface shear layer? Well, even that changes as a function of time. The rotation rate gradient there changes. And it, but here, it's the, the sunspots appear where the rotation rate gradient is smaller than the average. OK, so yeah, so again, hints, but we don't know what it means. This is the same thing, but a slightly different depth, so it doesn't matter. OK. And this also shows us, this figure shows us that the extent of that layer in the surface of the sun, that changes in size. It gets deeper at certain latitudes, at certain phases of the solar cycle. It gets shallower at certain places. And you can see that um, the sunspots are in the layer that where the radius is larger, meaning the layer is shallower. So again and again and again, we see this intimate relation between where the sunspot appears and where the flows change. Now we have to figure out why this is happening. And that is still, as I said, a mystery. Our simulations are hopeless at reproducing the near surface shear layer. So the magnetic effects on the near surface shear layer is still not quite known, except magnetic fields in, inhibit turbulence. And turbulence in the convection zone is supposed to aid in keeping the near surface shear layer formed. Don't ask me why. I'm not 100% sure. I don't quite understand the theory completely. But they have to be related. So, again, lots of mysteries. What about the tachocline? So this is a schematic figure of the tachocline. Remember this region where there's a sudden change in the in the rotation rate is known as the tachocline. And we've known from a, for a while now that the tachocline is exactly over what radius the shift happens and where the, sh the central portion of the shift, these are latitude dependent. So what we tried to look at is whether this jump in the change in the rotation rate has a solar cycle dependence. We did try to look at even the position, but the, the data were too noisy. So we looked at this jump. OK, so remember, equator has a higher rotation rate than the interior. So we call this jump positive. 60 degrees, you have a lower rotation rate than the interior. We call that jump negative, because you'll see in the next figure. So what does the solar cycle change in delta omega look like? There we are, the red points. So that's time. In the background, the gray curve are the sunspot numbers. So that's the maximum of cycle 23. That's the maximum of cycle 22. These red points are the jump in the rotation rate during the equator, at the equator, 15, 45, and 60 degrees. Two things stand out. One, three things actually, that the jump changes. 
two, that the change is different at different latitudes, and three, which is the most astounding feature of all, is that the change is not the same in each cycle. So cycle 23 and cycle 24, the changes are similar only at 60 degrees. But look at the equator. The cycle 24 change is much larger than cycle 23, yet cycle 24 was a weaker cycle. Okay. So, my given what the 15 degree and 45 degree uh, figures look like, my hypothesis, and we'll know that in a few years if it's correct or not, is that the tagok line is not following an 11 year cycle, but is probably following a 22 year cycle. Uh, what do I mean? So at the maximum of each cycle, the solar magnetic poles reverse. And then at the next cycle, it reverses back to normal. So we have an 11 year sunspot cycle, but a 22 year solar magnetic cycle. So it's quite possible that this is following not the sunspot cycle, but what's known as the Hale magnetic cycle. But we'll need more data and we have to be patient because sun, the sun, solar cycles are long. I think in five years time, we'll know whether this is coming down again or not. So mysteries which we've never been able, I mean, we know these are mysteries, but we didn't, we had no way of even knowing what's happening inside till we had these helioseismic data. So what I've also done is plot this, um, these jumps as a function of the strength of the solar, uh, of the magnetic field. Uh, it's not quite strength of the magnetic field, but it's a proxy for the strength of the magnetic field, which is the flux, radio flux at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters. It sort of follows the magnetic field almost exactly. So cycle 20, Three is in brown and red. Cycle 24 is in blue and purple. You can see that even at the same strength of the magnetic field, the cycle 23 and 24 results are different. Which means that the two cycles are fundamentally different in the solar interior. Now we know that solar cycles change, but this is the first time that we can actually show that the changes go very deep inside the sun. There was a solar cycle with a minimum in 1910, which seemed to be sort of like what solar cycle 24 was like before it started increasing. But we didn't have any helioseismic data from that time. I mean, the best helioseismic, da the helioseismic data that we use for this, they start in 1995. So yes, we have two solar cycles worth of data, but the sun is four and a half billion years old. Two, cycle, two solar cycles worth of data don't really tell us too much, except give us these tantalizing hints that we need to study this a bit more. Okay, so the solar part, I want to just reemphasize again that although the sun is the nearest star, we don't really understand it. I can tell you what the sun would be like, say, two billion years from now, but I cannot tell you what the sun is going to be like two years from now. We, we know the long, we understand the long time behavior of the sun because those are basically governed by the changes associated with nuclear fission in the sun. But the short time scales are associated with changing magnetic fields. And we do not really understand that very well. So the structure of the solar interior, we reproduce well. So we know we get the structure and evolution right, but rotation we cannot. Now, if you allow me a few more minutes, I could tell you how we do study other stars with seismology. I only have three more slides. Should I? Sure, ma'am. Okay. So this is the sun. Other stars are much more difficult because we have very little data. Okay. 
So, oops. How do we do other stars? Large stars pulsate in lower frequencies. Small stars pulsate in higher frequencies. Now, can you hear the tone? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. So this is an oboe. So it's got a very low pitch sound. This has a much higher sound. And that is exactly what happens with stars. Big stars oscillate with lower frequencies than small stars. So these are, the images are artificial, but the sound is a sonification of actual data. This is a star like the sun, about the same size, high pitched. This is, oops, slightly bigger than the sun. Slightly lower pitch, but larger amplitude. This is even more lower pitched. And this one is, I'll be surprised if, you, if you're able to hear this when I play this. Very low pitched. And so these relative frequencies allow us to figure out how big and how massive a star is. So I'm going to end you with my personal favorites. This is a white dwarf. Well, sorry, it's appeared brown here for some reason. It's supposed to be a white dwarf. White dwarfs have masses. White dwarfs are dead stars, so they have masses roughly like the sun. But their radii, their the size is like that of the Earth. So they oscillate in very high-pitched modes. And the other thing here, this is a double star system. As one star is going around the other, its tides are causing the other star to oscillate. And that is what you hear as a drumbeat. So seismology of other stars is a bit more complicated because we don't have much more data. But we're beginning to do that, and hopefully we'll have uh, I mean, we are learning how to do that, too. Uh, what allows us to do seismology is also the fact that we can do statistical studies. So we only have one sun, but we have many, many stars. So, OK, we can't study each star in detail, but we can take an ensemble of stars that are very similar and study all of those and make a statistical inference about them. So two very different ways of studying, but the idea behind them is these are stars that are pulsating. So I'm going to stop here and I'll be happy to answer questions. Okay, there's a frequency about, can you play the last one again? Sure. Do you want to dance to that? No, the one which uh, was, uh, Nine times larger is Isorson. Oh, like you said, it would be barely audible. Yeah. I mean, Can you hear that? Nope, absolutely yeah, not. Yeah, it's very low pitched, which is why it's it's difficult. Yeah. So my student Joel on took the data and remember I said the solar data are three, uh, have uh, periods of five minutes. That's too low a frequency for us to hear, similarly for these stars. So what's been done is for each case, we've artificially spun up the data, made the frequencies larger by a certain amount so that you could hear them. But the factor is the same in all so that the relative frequency remains the same. Um, so yeah, so there's a question is, how are these frequencies calculated? Uh, are you talking about what I played right now? These are not calculations. These are observations, but spun up. For models, we have codes that basically take the equations of stellar oscillations and solve them. They are eigenvalue codes, basically, because each of these frequencies is an eigen. Uh, eigenvalue 
of the oscillation eigenfunction. And how far can we observe such data for the stars? It's a very good question. The answer depends on how bright the star is. So giant stars like this, they are intrinsically very bright, so they can be seen to very large distances, a few kiloparsec. So parsec is the astronomy unit of distance, not a light year, light year is the popular unit. A parsec is about 3.6 light years. So you can see, observe these to a few kiloparsec easily. It's also not just the brightness, because, yeah, the brightness does matter, but also what matters is the amplitude of the pulsations. Ampl stars like the sun, the amplitude of the oscillation is a few parts per million. They become larger as the star evolves and red giants, which are very evolved stars, they have amplitudes of a few, uh, of a thousand parts per million of, or a few parts per thousand if you wish. So it depends on how you're looking at them. So, so most of the astroseismic data that we've used has come from the Kepler satellite. And TESS, which is observing now, is giving us a lot more data, but more of nearby stars. Uh, the, the next astroseismic mission is supposed to be the European mission called PLATO, which should be uh, launched sometime in... 2025 or 2026. So. so effects of migration of the solar spots and the equator cause due to differential. So the migration is, doesn't change the magnetic fields. It's the magnetic fields that are migrating. So sunspots are basically strong regions of migrating field. Change in frequency, what we found is that the higher the activity level of the sun is, the higher the frequencies of the sun. And uh, we're still trying, I mean, simple models don't explain that, but we think we know what is going on, but it's still a bit iffy. Is, does the, is the tachocline occurring at constant R over R ratio between the cycles? Um, almost constant, definitely, because when we try to look if the position changes, uh, the results were within the noise, and the data are good, which means at least within, say, 0.01 solar radius, there is no change whether it changes at the point 001 solar radius, I cannot say because the data are much too noisy for that. Any other questions? How are we planning to get better data? It's not so much getting better data, we are getting as good a data as we can, it's figuring out how to analyze the data properly. Um, there are suggestions. So remember I said you get an image, you do a spectral harmonic transform, and then you do a Fourier transform to get the frequencies. There are suggestions that maybe if we don't actually find the frequencies, but we make a model and then model the power spectrum itself with everything in it, we might be able to get better results. I'm not convinced yet but maybe that is the way to go. And about predicting, well, there's a lot of simulation work going on. It's clear that analytic work is going to be limited because this is a very complicated, the magnetic fields inside the sun are tangled. They're not as though, you know, you can say, oh, this is a lovely poloidal field. It's a lovely toroidal field. You get very tangled fields. And the only way you can do that is through large scale magnetohydrodynamic simulations. Unfortunately, magnetohydrodynamic simulations take lots and lots of computer time and lots and lots of nodes to actually just do that. So people are trying, but they haven't quite hit upon the correct parameter space yet. And the, also the issue with numerical simulations is you might get the result 
but then trying to understand what in the simulation gave you the result. You can get have one simulation and then spend years trying to understand what that simulation has given you. So it's, it's a hard field, but computers are more powerful, so there's hope. Anything else? Okay, if not, Pratyush, is this? Um, yeah, I'm, uh, what are the applications for this research? Uh, are they in... Applications in the sense, the idea is, okay, application is still very far away. The idea is that once you figure out what's happening inside the sun, once you see what's happening inside the sun, those form your observations. Then your theory must be able to predict, show those. If your theory can show, can uh, produce the current observations, model the current observations properly, then your theory should be able to predict what the future observations are going to be. So hopefully we can predict, oh, the next solar cycle is going to be very strong. So you need to start taking mitigation effects. How are you going to protect your power grid? How are you going to protect the satellites? When can you send astronauts? Because astronauts on the space station, they're so far above the atmosphere that they are exposed to radiation. So in that sense, the applications are, I would say, still many years ahead. We, we're not quite there yet. This is still a quest for knowledge. Anything more? So thank you for patiently waiting while I was waiting for my internet connection to come back and I have to figure out what had gone wrong. Uh, so. Thank you, ma'am, for this lecture. It was a very interesting topic. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, taking out the time and coming and telling us about this interesting topic. We really enjoyed the talk. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. And I'm just sorry that we had a break in the middle, but I'm I'm also happy that it didn't take too long for the uh, for the link to come back again. So uh, we're we're really glad that uh, the internet came back pretty soon. <laughs> okay, so thank you and good luck with all your studies and everything. And I'm always happy to see people who are interested in astronomy. Thank you so much. Uh, is last small request. Uh, is it possible to uh, share the slides you used? With? Can you share them? Uh, yeah, I can send you the PDF. I don't want to send the PowerPoints because some of it has copyrighted material. I mean, the sonifications are still being developed, but everything else is already published. So I can send everything else if that's okay. And I can point you to where you can find sonifications on the web. Will that That's be? Good. Okay, good. I'll send them to Pratyush and then he can, uh, he can distribute it, I suppose. Okay. So goodbye then.